Statistically speaking, most of us are relatively visual. Um, as humans, you know, our eyesight is much greater than that of other creatures, and so, like, we depend on our vision a lot. And studies have shown that if you create a visual matrix for your budget, rather than just like a list, it's more effective. Um, so there's different kinds of ways to, do, to visualize a budget. Um, you can do a budget matrix. So basically a spreadsheet. Spreadsheet. And this is probably the most common way to do your budget is with a spreadsheet. Um, and it can be a handwritten spreadsheet or an Excel or other, I don't know any other spreadsheet programs off the top of my head, but you get the idea. Okay, and you can do them two different ways. You can either use an icon, a check mark, an X, something like that to show what months you have these bills, because some bills are not every single month. Or you can put the amounts in, so when you look at it, you quickly know how much each of those things cost. And this is a preference. And that's the thing with a budget. Creating your budget is a personal preference. There's not a right or a wrong way for you to organize your budget. Um, I have known people that quite literally did everything with cash and they would have envelopes that they labeled, you know, rent, you know, electricity, groceries, or whatever, and that was their organization system. And when the money in that envelope was gone, they didn't buy anything else in that category. You know, so there's other people that have these big programs devoted to budgeting and tracking and it imports your banking information and like does all this crazy stuff. I don't even know how to use those programs like QuickBooks and Quicken and all these things that'll do all sorts of stuff for you. And then there's everything in between. And it's like I said, it's personal. Um, some people like lists, some people like spreadsheets, whatever works for you. Um, but whenever you're using a spreadsheet, it's known as a bu budget matrix. Okay. Um, the checkoff matrix is the one where you're checking things off. Now, the reason that you might use a checkoff matrix is just as a reminder, maybe. For example, um, prescriptions. Sometimes with some insurances, rather than picking up a one-month supply of a prescription, they'll give you a three-month supply of the prescription. So you'll know you need to pick it up every three months, which means you'll need to budget for it every three months. And that can be kind of a reminder to, hey, this amount of money has to be ready on those months. Um, insurance, some people pay monthly, some people pay quarterly, some people pay every six months. It just depends on what arrangements you make with the insurance company. So there's different things like that. Um, I'm not worrying about order of the thing. Okay, there's other ways. Uh, pie charts. You know, you can have like a nice pretty pie and this big wedge here is for rent and this little wedge over here is for savings and, you know, wedges. Um, you can have line graph. Those could be changes over, the over time. Maybe you're charting your electrical bill, your electric usage, your water usage. Line graphs are really good ways to visualize that. Uh, bar graphs, pretty much the same thing as a line graph. They're good ways to make comparisons over time. Um, and then budget line graphs take two categories of expenses, and it it can it. Make sure that the two categories never go over the top amount that you can use. Okay, so monthly, we know what that is. That's 12 times a year. Quarterly is every 
three months, semi-annually, every six months, and then you have some that are monthly but only for certain months, like if you live up north, you do not have to mow your lawn in the winter because it's covered with snow. But you have to maybe get snow removal. Okay, um, bed expenses, child care. So we're going to do a checkoff matrix for each of these. Um, mortgage you pay every month. Till you pay the house off. Utilities you pay every month. You know, until you live in a tent. Sanitation every three months quarterly. Now it doesn't say when it starts, so we're just going to start it in January. So January through March, and then April through June, and then July through September, and then October through December. Insurance semi-annually, that's every six months. Again, it doesn't tell us what month, so we'll just do it in January and July. So July, not June. June is the sixth month. That would be one of the first six, right? So July starts the next six months. Internet, semi-annually. This is a weird internet company. You only have to pay for it twice a year. Uh, your landline, that's monthly. Your cell phone, that's monthly. Lawn and garden is only April through September. And then snow removal is November, January, and March. Food, well, you got to eat. You don't get to skip that. Child care, every month, other month beginning in February. So you pay with February, not March. You pay April, not May. You pay June, not July. You pay August, not September. You pay October not November, and you pay December. And then vet expenses every six months. Now with this particular matrix, if you broke up your semi-annually this way, oh sorry, if you broke up your semi-annually this way to where all your semi-annual ones were in June, January, and July, that's going to make January and July very expensive months. Okay, You could change that you could arrange it so that maybe you paid your insurance one month over and then maybe you paid your internet two months over you know you could shift these things that's the kind of thing that this kind of a matrix is good for too is you can really see your expensive months you can plan for them and then you can see can i shift anything to a not as expensive month like March doesn't have as much stuff in it. May doesn't have as much, you know, maybe you can shift. Probably don't shift anything into December though, because that's an expensive month in and of its own right without those, right? Any questions on this? Um, pie chart? The pie wedge is called a sector. The angle here is called the central angle. The radius is the length from the center to the side. And the whole circle measures 360 degrees. And if you're going to create an accurate pie chart, you have to use that 360 degrees. Okay, so let's just say we wanted to do, um, we'll just do this one. Okay, we've got a budget. He's got 40% going to his household. He's got 5% to miscellaneous, 
10% to savings, 5% to health, 15% to transportation, and 25% to education. Now, household includes things like utilities, I'm sure, and food. Right? Okay. He used a software program to construct this. How did the percentages affect the construction of the chart? Well, if we look at the household, that's 40%, which is 0.4. And then you do 0.4 times 360 degrees. Okay, so this wedge is going to have a central angle of 144 degrees. So if we were making a pie chart by hand, we'd draw a circle with a compass, and then we would use a protractor and a, you know, a straight edge. We'd draw a radius, and then we'd use the protractor to measure out 144 degrees, and then draw a line through that. And then um, education was 25%, which is 0.25. So we do 0.25 times 360 degrees. And you get a 90 degree wedge right here. So that's how you construct the pie chart. Of course, you can use a software program. Excel will do pie charts for you. Remember, we did those with the stock market project. So um, on stock market, you put in a dollar amount for each of the companies, but you could put in percentages if you wanted to and create a pie chart that way. Any questions on that? Okay. Here we have a pie chart, but we don't have percentages. Um, we know that this whole pie chart is worth $800. We can make some guesses based on the sizes of the wedge. What we do is go, if you make a straight line, which it's hard to do because I'm trying to follow the line that was there, this is about 50% and this is about 50%. Okay. And then if we make another straight line here, this is 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%. So if the whole circle is 800, half of it is 400. So this is 200, 200, 200, 200. Roughly $200 is going to fuel. Okay, we've got just a little over 200 going to insurance and repairs. Do those look about the same size to you or does insurance look a little bigger? Insurance looks a little bigger. Okay, so if this whole thing is 200 and then we've got this little bit over here, how much do you think that's worth? 220, 230, 250, 210? What would you guys guess? Yeah, both the insurance and the repairs because they're going a little past the 200 mark. 215? Okay, so we'll say that's about 215 altogether. You guys say the insurance is a little bit more than the repairs. So why don't we say like insurance is around 115 and repairs are around 100? Okay, well, we took $15 out of this wedge. So that means we have 185 left. And we've got car wash parking and part of the train and bus. So actually, why don't we come over here and do miscellaneous and train bus first? How much do you think train and bus and miscellaneous all together would be? So more than 200. We said this was about 215, so 230, 240, 225. What do you guys think? 
2.30. Okay, so we'll say this part's about 2.30, including the... So we have to take another 30 away from that. Train and bus, much bigger than miscellaneous. How do you split the 2.30? Just guessing on the sizes of the wedges. 150 to 8, 180. No, sorry, not 150, 180, it's 230. 150 and 80, that's what I missed. What do you think, 150 and 80? Okay, so we'll say miscellaneous is 80. Train is about 150. And then car wash and parking is 155 together. So how much of that is parking and how much of that is car wash? We're guessing as best as we can. 60 for car wash? 95, 95? As long as these add up to 100 or to 800, we're good. And you'll notice that our sizes of our dollar amounts correspond to the sizes of our wedges because if we put these in lowest to highest, we'd go 60, 80, 95, 100, 115. 150, 200, so the wedges would go in order size-wise as the price, so it's good enough. Questions on that at all? No questions? Okay. Bar graphs. We're going to make bar graphs using the information about health-related costs on page coordinates. We don't have that page. Okay, so... We have insurance, prescriptions, over-the-counter medication, doctor's visits, life insurance, and health club dues. What we're going to do is we're going to create a bar graph for the year based on this information. So the first step is going to be to get these totals. So 230 here, 120, um, or 80. Or 40, 50, 590, 250, or 40, 1100, 120, 30, and um, Hmm? Is it 820? Close, 870. Okay, so those are our monthly totals. And we're going to use a ruler. Not really, hold on. Okay, to draw our nice pretty lines. Uh, we have the lowest price of 30 and the highest of 1100. So actually need to make this probably taller. Got January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and December. I'm going to move these prices over. The 
this is going to be 1100. Way down here is going to be 30. So I'm going to say that's 50, 100, 150, 200, 250, 300. That's not going to really fit, is it? That got me to a thousand, actually. It almost fit. 950, 1,000, 1050, 1100. Right there. Okay, that's 50. It's 150, 250. Okay, January is 230. We have 200 and 250, 230 is in between there. So you get your nice ruler and you draw your perfect space line. Oh, it didn't take, okay, good. <clears throat> and then you take uh, 120, which is just below 150. And then you have 480. You guys get the idea, right? Forty is going to be a little bit less than that. Meaning Tower of Pisa. Now that we've constructed our bar graph. We can use this to see how our spending is throughout the year on health-related expenses. As you can see, um, September and December are pretty high. And then you've got months like November and May that don't have really any. What you want to do ideally in your budget, if you know that these are going to be set amounts, they're going to be the same every year, you want to find an average, say probably somewhere in here, that you put away every month, that'll give you all of this with a lesser impact on your monthly budget. So your $600 health club dues that you pay in September, don't wait till September to come up with the $600, start putting that away budget it in all year and then it's a smaller impact. It's only $50 a month that way. You set it aside. This is for health club dues. It's in the budget. It doesn't get touched. And then in September you have 600 bucks and it's not such a punch. Does that make sense? Because this is very difficult to budget, this up and down thing, because your income is not going up and down with the bills. Right? Just because I have you know bigger bills in September doesn't mean I made more money in September. <clears throat> Any questions on that? All right. Um, eh. We're gonna stop here actually.